Welcome to Trillions. I'm Joel Weber. And I'm Eric Balchunas. Eric, we've had a couple guests on lately, but we have not been talking about what's happening in the markets, which seems like we should do. Yeah, I mean, in a way, it's because nothing traumatic has happened, but there's always something going on, and that something is all-time highs. Like, it's almost like so peaceful and nice and all-time high out there, you forget about it. But that's a story in itself, because it just seems like, also, we're in a different place than normal. Always felt like last times we were in this bull market and all-time highs, there was this sort of, quote, wall of worry, and it was all about how the market kind of would deal with that. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of things to worry about. So there's like... Oh, come on. There's the threat of nuclear uh, war. <laughs> there's, you know, inflation has popped back up a little bit. I mean, there's like, it's not like there isn't things to worry about. Yeah, but all those things I think have been compartmentalized, which brings up our bit, one of our big themes this year, which we have Athanasios on to talk about, which is investors being ready for it, comfortably bullish. Other uh, sell side shops quote Taylor Swift, we quote Pink Floyd, you know, it's all good. But anyway, this idea of not just, you're not euphoric bullish and you're not, it's not a hated bull market. It's a comfortable bullishness. You know what I'm trying to say? Comfortably it numb. It feels right. Yeah. And the numbness is part of it in that I don't think these things you just mentioned, they're out there, but they're not as up close and present, I think, for the investor psyche right now. I think they've written them all off. Obviously, the Fed raising rates would be a big deal, but that doesn't seem like it's going to happen. And I don't even think the market expects Fed's the, f f rates lower. I think they're okay even if it doesn't get lower. So it just seems like there's a comfort level here that might be the, sto the, the story or the feeling this year is. And wh whether that, that obviously will get disrupted at some point, but it just feels pretty smooth right now. You guys at Bloomberg Intelligence also did an ETF survey. We did. Speaking of bullishness, we have a survey that uh, first ever time we did it, we, we've had BBH on who did their own survey. We did one. Charles Bond uh, from our data group led it uh, completely. He deserves all the credit. Great job. And we inter we basically got results from over 50 people, different areas, and we'll go over some of those uh, results. Some, some are what you'd expect, some surprises, but a lot of bullishness towards ETFs, Joel. And joining us on this episode, Athanasio Serafagas of Bloomberg Intelligence. He's an analyst with Eric to help walk us through this moment and the survey. This time on Trillions, let the good times roll. Athanasios, welcome back. Glad to be back. The good times are rolling. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, they are. You know, the good thing about, you, know, you guys were talking about bullishness of ETFs. They've gotten so large, right? And there's so many different strategies that we can actually like you know, use them as indicators, right? Sort of for market strength and market sentiment. And, you know, the market hit all-time highs in 2021, and we're at all-time highs again. But I think the dynamics are very different. And Eric had mentioned that earlier about, like, being euphoric. Like, we're feeling good, but we're not overly euphoric, which I think is actually a good thing, right? And this is where we came up with the term, like, comfortably bullish. And if you remember in 21, it was all, like, the meme stocks. It was Portnoy saying stocks only go up. Like, it was craziness, right? You're not having any of that this year. Um, even though we're at all-time highs, I feel like we're just in a good spot. Right? That was just NVIDIA, NVIDIA, NVIDIA. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like every time something happens, some company bails out the queues. It's like NVIDIA or Microsoft. Like someone is always sort of carrying the market on. Does it remind you of like a basketball team where like um, take the Sixers. I live in Philly. Sometimes MB just isn't feeling it or he's injured and Maxi steps up. The Magnificent Seven to me is like a team and like Tesla – uh, NVIDIA kind of balanced out Tesla and they are real players, but they are really kind of uh, lifting this market up. Although there's some people who point out it is actually more depth than those seven. But certainly I know when NVIDIA's earnings came out, it did. People were saying like the whole world, they had memes of like NVIDIA holding up the globe. Um, NVIDIA seems to be like the new Apple in a way in terms of holding the market up, but it delivered. Yeah, I agree. Every like every time. Um... In fact, every time I log in every morning, like the queues are at a new time, like all time high. Um, but I think it kind of makes sense when you look around the world or look at other investments. I think it's all about like relative, right? So like if the Fed is going to cut for this year, like for money market funds, we already know that the best of that is probably behind us. So imagine like you already know that that's only going to go down. So like, okay, where am I going to look? China's a little rough right now, you know, like performance wise. Europe is a story that, you know, seems like it wants to work every year, but it doesn't. It just feels like all the roads 
come back to U.S. stocks. It's just still sort of the best option out there. Mm. And if you could, let's talk a little bit about the BI ETF greed fear indicator, which you created with Charles Bond. Um, it's obviously up. But what goes into that? What ETF data are you able to use for that? Yeah, um, yeah, big prop to Charles. We sort of were hashing out ideas. So we look at a couple of things. One is leverage long to short ETF, like leverage tradings. We look at uh, moving average. Uh, so, so a lot of some technical indicators. We look at short interest, how much people are shorting ETFs. Uh, and we sort of put that together and we look at it historically to itself. And when you look back in 21, it got overly bullish, right? And then the market corrected a little bit. And then um, this year, we're very bullish, but we're not at this like euphoric range. So I actually even think it could probably go up a little bit more. Like I think we have room to get even more bullish. Hmm. Um, but, uh, and when I was talking with Charles, that's how we came up with the like the word comfortably bullish. Like I like Pink Floyd and whatnot, but we're like, how do you feel right now? I'm like, that's how I feel. Like I feel good, not too good, but like in a good spot. Market keeps going on. People are, I remember last year when the market was going up, flows weren't biting. People were still very pessimistic about the market going up. I feel like this year, finally, it's all aligned. The market's going up. The flows are aligning. You know, sentiment feels good. Can you quantify comfortably bullish? <laughs> uh, well, we attempted to, right? But I think the way we always we look at it is just relative to itself. So even... Now we're at all-time highs. Flows weren't as good as they were in 21, even though we're at a higher level than we were. And I feel like when you look at it at that flows or leverage trading spreads or um, even what kind of ETFs people are allocating to, um, you know, we are bullish, but not how we were in 21. Hmm. So um, that's kind of the way we try to quantify it. I can give you an arbitrary number, say, oh, it's a four, right? But I think when you compare it to itself, that's how we sort of approach the, this sentiment indicator. And you know, it's interesting. I look at the weekly flow chart every week on ETF IQ and IVV, VU, Qs, VTI, all at the top, right? Comfortably bullish, everybody. But there's every like fourth week, someone tries to get small caps going. Like you see IWM there or like BBEU Europe. Someone tries to be like early on the shift or the regime change and they just get rolled over. And I've seen it happen over and over. And I think everybody out there knows that at some point the regime will change, but how many times can you get run over before you just uh, stop trying? And I think I've seen in the flows, there's less and less of that, those attempts. And maybe when there are no attempts at all ever, you know, we're just like weeks and weeks where nobody's trying, maybe that's when it turns. And that's when it's like a bubble where even a little pin can pop it. But small caps, uh, you know, we had a note out that talked about this and in this case, we referenced Mean Girls, Joel. The market to ETF investors stop trying to make small caps happen, you know, because they tried over and over and over. And I talked with Gina Martin Adams, our macro strategist, my boss, about this, and she brought up a good point. A, if a company gets really good and they're small, they get like drafted up, like all of a sudden they're a mid or a large and they're gone. So you lose them, like a college to the NBA. And then more companies when the IPO now are going right to the large. They're already big. So the, the pool of hotness in the small cap area is also down. And so I think this idea that it has to change, there are reasons where it could be a little more secular than cyclical. Hmm. I'm just thinking about how different now is compared to 2021, well, the last time that there was this fever, I guess. And boy, there's a world of difference between those two markets. How, how is that reflected and how is it showing up not only in the flows, but you know where, what sectors the flows are going into. Yeah, so I'd say the first thing that stuck out we observed, and I know this is, it sounds a little obvious, but more allocations towards the U.S. I feel like in 2021, money was getting allocated all over the world. Like Europe was taking some flows, China. This year, it's just all U.S. and it's U.S. from other regions. Um, there was even this issue in China, and the thing is, the Chinese investors were trying to buy the queue so fast that they had to close the fund in China, right? So they weren't buying Chinese stocks, they were buying US stocks. So if you actually look globally, I think a big difference is everything is going even more so into the US. Uh, the other thing is we have higher rates, right? So now I think what the important thing was for this year is that we showed that we could live in this like 5% rate right. world, right? Yeah, which I, I would have assumed looked like a cold shower almost, but here we are. Yeah, for sure. And I don't know if people maybe expected it, right? I think they've kind of expected the market to go down and, you know, it was pretty volatile in 2022. 
But now it's like, you know what? We went we went through that. We're fine. We can handle it. Right. Um, and now like we sort of know that the Fed's already made it clear that at some point they're going to cut. Right. So, um, this, you know, so I think we have a lot of those uncertainties behind us. I know there's an election coming up this year and whatnot that could all, you know, could maybe, you know, uh, derail this a little bit. But I think it's just we've learned to live in this higher rate environment. Yeah, it was interesting. Those big, growthy, sort of uh, magnificent seven companies. One thing that impressed me was they went up last year, and rates were going were up. Like they were supposed to be companies that didn't work in higher rate environments. But then you look at some of these companies. Unlike maybe some of the ARC stocks, these companies have a lot of cash on hand. Like they can absorb a lot. They're not like high growth, no profit kind of companies. The other thing about the magnificent seven that Sam Rowe pointed out um, on Twitter. He was talking about how if you take one of them, there's actually three or four, even five companies in there that could be like smaller mid caps or even large caps. Like YouTube to me could be its own company, a large cap probably. I mean, it's taken over TV and it's just one part of Google, right? So you go down the list and you see these companies are made up of many, many companies. So maybe it's the Magnificent 50, honestly, and not just the seven. What do you think of that, Joel? Uh, Lena Khan would have it that way for sure if she got to do some do overs. Um, uh, and and look, I mean, it does speak to why the queues are the queues. Like, I, I think if if you knock those companies out, like, there's just more queue candidates, really, right? And then when you look at the rest of the world, and this sounds so US centric, but you know, wh- where are these companies in other countries? I know sometimes people are like, well, there might be one or two, but we have like a dozen, you know, we have many of these. And it's hard to capture that. And I, it's tough. The China, the people coming over from China and Europe, Joel, the, the, what I worry about in China in particular is their market just went down two years in a row. And they're like at the bottom. That's when you should actually buy in. Mm. But they're leaving to come here to buy at the top. Yeah. That's, this is like has pain written all over it, in my opinion. But I just feel like this could end in tears, Joel. You know, that, that movement usually doesn't work out well. And it's a shame, too, because those investors are, you know, they're just, the FOMO is that bad. Mm. You know, it's like they've lost their minds. Well, they're comfortably. <laughs> well, no. Well, yeah, they want to be comfortably <laughs> bullish. Yeah. They're coming over here to have that right. good here feeling. You go. Got, got it yeah, yeah. I agree. I think 54% of the queues last year was not expected. I think that messed with people's minds, right? Like every strategist was not bullish last year, right? Everyone missed. Now all of a sudden everyone's bringing up their targets. Like FOMO is a real thing, right? Um, and it was working when a time when it's not supposed to work, and now it is supposed to work. And you know, um, and I think that is keeping people coming back into the equity market. Mm-hmm. And I think if if someone's out there listening, it's like, what do you do? Go into more U.S. equities. You know, most advisors will probably advise you to rebalance, actually, which is to you know rebalance into what has not done well. Um, and we see some of that. It's not like the places we're saying have no flows, but generally speaking, people are leaning into U.S. equities and. Uh, this is opposite last year. Ethan was on this time last year, and what we were talking about was the U.S. market was up, but nobody was buying in. There were no flows. We call it the FOMO drought. So comfortably bullish is the new FOMO drought. Hmm. Well, what will it be next year? God, please help us, because everything's <laughs> gone to shit. Yeah. <laughs> That's a little long. I have to t- tighten that up. Yeah, we'll have to, we'll have yeah, to, we'll go, have to work on that. We'll that have was to just, go through some I'm albums. just spitballing, Joel. We'll have to go through some albums and come up with a good title for next year. Okay, so you guys have this Bloomberg Intelligence survey of whom? And what was the what were you trying to figure out? Yeah, look, well, we got a little FOMO um, because other people were doing these surveys. And Charles Bond on our team who works in data in, uh, in Europe said, we should do our own. And I said, yeah, I've always wanted to do it, but I never had the resources. Now we do. We have, you know, the team's bigger. So he basically went through all the hurdles, and there are a lot, to get a survey done on BI. Normally, Joel, when I survey people, I just go to Twitter, do a poll, and I know in like eight minutes what the people think. But that's not as official, and I can't really put that into a nice formal note. So we polled about, I think it was over 50 people, financial advisors, individuals, and institutions, and they were all over the world. And we basically, largely in North America and Europe, but we basically asked them a bunch of questions. And then we put those in the notes, and there were a couple big takeaways. Do you want to go over the takeaways, or you want to hone in on a couple notes? Let's, t- let's do the takeaway. Okay. Effect. Me, the big takeaway is um, active is back. I've seen these surveys for years and years, and 
one thing that was clear was that there's much more openness to active. And I think this is because active's gotten cheaper. And I think it's because 2021 was rough and people, uh, 60 and the 40 went down and people were like a little more open to active. So I think it's good for active. Sometimes these surveys are a little bit recency bias. You know, active just had a good year, but clearly that's good news for active. That was one of our takeaways. Um, thematic equity ranked number one in what would you like to see more of? Discretionary active was two, but thematic, and we've always been bullish on thematics because it's a great complement to cheap beta. It's not competing with it. You can just add a little theme on top of your cheap beta. You don't disturb all the serious stocks. You can have a little fun. So thematic equity did better than I thought in terms of what people want to see more of and what really did not do well, no surprises, ESG. That's fallen down. It ranked below money market funds in terms of what you want to see. And nobody wants to see much from money market funds, right? That's pretty boring. It was like number seventh, eighth in the list. So there's a shifting uh, going on in some of the, you know, sort of more um, non-beta areas. Hmm. So that would be probably the biggest takeaway, but there was a couple other little ones in here that we can go over. Ethan, what, what jumped out at you in the survey? One thing that was interesting was how investors are picking ETFs and some of the criteria that they're looking at. So one thing I thought was really interesting, we had asked, what is the minimum asset threshold you want before you buy an ETF? And like more than half was less than 30 million. Some had no minimum threshold at all. So I thought that it shows a lot of progress in the investor, right? And that they're not just looking at the, the big products with the big assets. They're they're looking at a lot of interesting ideas, right? And products, a lot of some of the more interesting ones are small. They're new. They're coming from smaller issuers. So I'd like to see that the investors were looking at smaller ETFs. And I think it shows that they understand the products more and how they right. work. Right. Yeah, that was a shocker for me because... Over the years, we come up with, we come up with that field implied liquidity, which is based on Dave Abner's formula from his book, The ETF Handbook, and um, that just tells you how liquid the basket is. Because if you're out there listening and you're looking at ETFs and you look at the volume, it's good to have volume. That's really great. You can trade those all day. But there's new ETFs, for example, that don't have a lot of volume. But if the if market makers in the market, when they see orders come in for an ETF, they don't look at the actual ETF. They look at the basket. Because if they're going to sell you the ETF, I'm just going to give you shares of, say, ARK, since it's come up a bunch of times. Well, I'm now short ARK. Well, I'm going to go and buy the basket of the of the stocks because later I've got to go hand in the basket to the issuer and get the shares back so I'm flat again. So in order to sell you ARK, I've got to go get the basket of stocks. So if the basket of stocks is a liquid, I should be able to give you a good deal, even if ARK doesn't trade a lot. Hmm. And that's generally why implied liquidity works most in a stock you don't have that the liquidity on the screen is all there is but with an etf because you can do creations of redemptions by handing in the basket for more shares of the etf the basket liquidity is just as usable and so in the first book i wrote which you know uh, that's how we met <laughs> uh you know implied liquidity to me is the key to unlocking the toolbox and using more etfs beyond the most popular ones you can go deep there are like a handful of ETFs that have neither high volume, they have low volume and low implied liquidity. Like for example, iShares Columbia, local Columbia stocks, it doesn't trade a lot. The stocks don't trade a lot. That's a case where you're going to have to pay up in a big spread. But if you have one or the other, you should demand tight spreads in your trading. And I think that's the takeaway here that people are getting. Okay. What else helped out of you? Um, the one about would always say, okay, when you're on this selection criteria, what are some of the things you're looking at? Or like size, expense ratio, performance. And I think the one that came up first was past performance, which is really interesting. And I think- Yeah, that was weird to me because it's like obviously past past performance, not indicative of future performance. Yeah, exactly. And expense ratio, I think, was second. So I don't know, again, if there's some regency bias because of the market has been up. But I think as expense ratio goes down, that's probably ultimately a good thing, right? It means that the market is very, it's at a low point cost-wise, right? So we're starting to look at other things besides just expense ratio. We're looking at branding, we're looking at performance, looking at liquidity. Um, so that was really interesting that perform, I don't know if I agree that performance should be the top one, but I thought it was interesting that expense <clears throat> ratio had moved down on the list. Well, that's one, when I jumped on for active, I thought that was a sign that active was getting more looks. That's a good point. Because you would look at past performance if you're picking an active yeah. manager. But to your point, you know, when you, you came out with that that um, chart that showed that over half of the ETFs now, Joel, are in funds that are less than 10 basis points. And if you look at smart beta, you see the same cost migration. Even ESG, before it kind of went in the gutter, had this cost migration. 
everything goes through this crucible and active just went through it. And there's three or four issuers that are leading this low cost active charge. So I think once expense ratio gets below a point where they're not going to care if it's five, six basis points different, but they just give me a good deal. And then after that, I can just start looking at other things. So active was the last thing to go through this. But now that it's gone through, I think to your point, expense ratio is going probably going to fall down because it's going to be given that it's cheap. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what we're seeing. And one more chart to riff off of the active is, have you increased your exposure to actively managed ETFs in the last 12 months? 35% said yes to equity ETFs and 30% to bond ETFs. Normally bond active had been the, the main place to go active in ETFs. I mean, it had like probably 10 to one assets for a while, but equity has finally caught up. So the fact that equity active beat bond active is big deal. Good sign for the industry. But again, it's also part of, uh, it's, it's a mixed blessing. It's good. They want it. But I think a lot of managers are going to have to go through the crucible of, you know, adjusting their fees to this new sort of lower fee era. But over time, the flow should make up for it. So I think that's what we're going to continue to see. How much of that do you think is rooted in, in the transparency that an ETF provides? Like the fact that you can actually see what the product holds and the prices come down. That to me together is perhaps why the numbers are what they are. Transparency, I would put as maybe the third advantage. Um, but I think it matters. I think, you know, I think ARC showed this. ARC put it's all its holdings out. It tells you what it trades every day. I mean, it's like out loud and proud. I'm like, here's what I do. And a lot of managers look at that as showing their hand or their IP. And Kathy really made all that look a little silly. And I think for, unless you're a gigantic $100 billion fund, front running shouldn't be too big of a fear. So what we found is the active non-transparent ETFs came out and they um, flopped. The active transparent came out, they did well. But there is a, you can't just sit, co correlate that. The reason is if you look at the active non-transparent, they were also more expensive. My thesis on this is that if you're the kind of person who thinks your IP is so special that like your percent weight in Amazon is so much, it's like so valuable because you're a genius, you're more likely to charge more. Whereas if you're somebody who has a little more of a perspective, you're one of like a thousand active managers and we're all trying our best here. I'll show you what I hold. You're more likely to charge a lower fee. So I found that the transparency usually is linked more with people who are willing to charge less. And that's why I think we can't totally untangle it being a transparent versus non, but certainly I think it helps. Yeah, I agree. I think people like to see it. Like, I think NVIDIA is a perfect case. I, the stock's been running up. I bet you everyone would go in and say, is this manager holding NVIDIA? Okay, phew, they're holding it. And if they're not, I feel like, why are they not holding NVIDIA, right? So I think whether or not people want to use a transparency is, is a different question, but I think people like to see it, um, especially when it comes to like a hot stock like that. All right, let's close it out. I heard you might have some humor for me. Yeah, so we asked two questions at the end that just were just a little off open-ended, kind of like creative. Uh -huh. And so one of them was, describe the ETF market in two words or less. You got, why don't you guys guess? Can you guess, like, just give me a word you think is in here a lot. Or how would you describe it? Growing. Wow, dude, that's like the number one answer. Yeah. This is family feud, you're going right back. <laughs> don't even need to hear anybody else. Uh, <laughs> how, how fast is it growing, I guess? I guess you could have an adjective in front of it. Yeah, but I mean, honestly, growth or growing was like 20% of the answers. Um, by far the most popular. Why don't you guess now? I mean, I saw well, the you, list. You, Could you, I maybe say the one I liked? Oh, yeah. Okay. Say the one you liked. Um, it was the Investor Nirvana. Yeah. That was a good one. That, that's yeah. a little, that's very specific. And it's true, right? There's 3,000 plus products. There's literally anything. Eric mentioned Columbia, or you want you know access to oil or Bitcoin now, whatever. It's literally, it's just, it's paradise from an investor perspective. And if we go with like synonyms for growing or the spirit of growing, we've got booming, uh, fantastic, fast, great. Get getting saturated. Holy cow with a question mark. That was interesting. Um, irreversible trend. Just the beginning. Mature and growing. Um, here's a couple that were inter interesting. Narrow, oversaturated, um, transparent, cheap, wild, without alternatives. So yeah, a lot of optimism. A couple little digs in there, like mm. narrow. I think some people do worry it's getting too crazy and 
um, niche and gimmicky. I mean, the moment you wrap Bitcoin in an ETF, yeah. it's like, okay, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The shark. Yeah, what jump, happened jump to my industry? In? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what was the last? Uh, As he would say, what have they done to my son? Ma- massacred my, my boy. No, they massacred my boy. <laughs> okay. Yeah, only like on our team, like seven out of ten people will not get that, yeah. but they should. They should. I feel like we, everyone needs to watch that movie. I know. The team. It should be a requirement. There's a couple movies that you need when you enter the like work. <laughs> Just a three or four. I will gladly listen to Taylor, Taylor Swift albums as a trade-off. Wow, Taylor Swift albums is pretty good. I oh, mean, the Godfather I, is it? I, it is, no, we're, yeah, this is a decent trade-off. Yeah. Okay. All right, <laughs> and and the fi- your final uh, moment of zen. Okay, because it, it leads to the final question in this podcast, which is. What's your favorite ticker? Okay, so we got everybody's favorite ticker. So you asked them? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so what do you uh, what do you think the number one answer was? Remember, we this is across Europe well, too. I was gonna say, I mean, Moo comes up more than anything else. Did Moo make a showing? Moo had two. Okay. That's pretty good. I mean, that'd be like the fifth answer. So we would Hack. if it were family Wait. feud, that would register, but like low. Was Hack in there? Hack was in there, but also a little low. You have to think a lot of people just aren't that creative. Yeah. I mean, spy. Yeah, number one. Yes, spy was number yeah. one. <laughs> uh, so just, that, that I'll just, take the S and P. Or people were like, "Look, I just filled out your nineteen questions. I'm just get the hell out of here." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like the last one. Like, <clears throat> well, nineteen out of nineteen. Like, yeah, dude. Like, I'm yeah, not thinking. Again. I'm not there's thinking anymore one. for you. Okay, spy out. Um, Robo got an answer. Weed got one. Um, Ellie, E L L E F P. I guess that's like the magazine Ellie. Um, CEFs. I bet that's the person who that person might actually work there. Um, Cows got one. C O W Z. Cars. Calf. Jep Q got one. J and K. Somebody pick J J P S T. Come yeah. on. I mean, I guess are they J-P-S-T. thinking about creative tickers like ones that they like? like I, it's I, his I, favorite ETF ticker, not managed by your firm. There oh, is I no see. way somebody picked J P S T. What happened is they probably that was the last one they invested in or something. And again, they were just like, my brain is, I'm just yeah. done. I mean, I still think direction kind of is the best of this. They got gush, drip, deposit, yeah. withdrawal. Like yeah. They have so many good tickers. The problem is most normal people aren't dabbling with those yeah. sort of rated R products, but you, certainly they've got the best ones. My, well, my yin and yang, I think are legendary. Good ones. It's a 3X d- China d- d- inverse. Somebody put those in there? No, but to me, that, that I would yeah. pick something like that probably, but there was no leverage in here at all. Um, and J and K got a, a mention MXUS power that's pretty interesting even though they're not what related power? at all I think cows is sort of like a like a cousin of moo yeah I agree I think livestock yeah. did well it lends itself to <laughs> yeah if you add all the livestock I think it might tie spy so there you go I think that's yeah. the takeaway right. people like cows Joel Ethan thanks for joining us on Trillions thanks for having me Thanks for listening to Trillions. Until next time, you can find us on the Bloomberg Terminal, Bloomberg.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you'd like to listen. We'd love to hear from you. We're on Twitter. I'm at Joel Weber Show. He's at Eric Balchunas. This episode of Trillions was produced by Magnus Hendrickson. Bye.